In this episode in the series Victorian Art Pottery, we will be looking at the works of William de Morgan. And in, for this talk, I'll be joined by my colleague, Dr. Anne Anderson. William de Morgan is considered to be Britain's foremost art pottery of the late 19th century. His reputation is based not only on the quality of his work and his innovative techniques for decorating art ceramics, but also for his standing in the artistic community of Victorian England. He was a close friend of William Morris, mixed freely with many of the leading aesthetes and pre-Raphaelite painters of the day, and became a leading figure in the arts and crafts movement. Born in 1839, De Morgan was educated at University College School London and then at University College itself. He wanted to be an artist, a painter, and in 1859 entered the Royal Academy schools to learn drawing and composition. But it was not to be. After two years, he came to the conclusion that the life of a conventional artist did not appeal. And so in 1861, he left the academy to try his hand at other things. This was the year in which Morris Marshall Falker & Co was established, William Morris's firm, to produce, among other things, stained glass and hand decorated tiles. In 1862, De Morgan met the artist Henry Holliday, with whom he developed a lifelong friendship and who introduced him to William Morris. Later that year, in December, Holiday was approached by a representative of James Powell and Sons, the famous glassmaking firm, who asked him to design some stained glass windows for them, as their usual designer, Edward Bird Jones, had moved over to work with his friend William Morris in his new company. Soon, Holiday was to become one of Powell's leading designers. It was almost inevitable that de Morgan should also become involved in designing stained glass. While working with glass, he began to notice the thin metallic lustres that sometimes appeared on the surface of the glass when it had been heated. And it was this intriguing effect that he later became determined to reproduce on the surface of ceramic vessels and tiles. William Morris encouraged William de Morgan in his experimentation and in producing these wonderful tiles and uh, vessels to the extent that he was soon uh, selling de Morgan's products in his own showroom, preferring them to cheaper mass produced tiles. There were many tiles available uh, usually with printed design, which Morris could have used in his interior design projects, but he preferred to use the tiles produced by William de Morgan. Their hand decorated designs conformed very much to Morris's craft principles and were recommended by him to his clients. In 1869, he set up a kill in his house at 40 Fitzroy Square and started production. Now, whereas Morris was interested in the English medieval, William de Morgan was interested in Near Eastern and Hispano Moresque wares produced in Spain in the 14th and 15th centuries. In keeping uh, with these interests, when he came to produce decorated vessels, he used a limited range of bright pigment colors and colored lusters. By the early 1870s, his range of colours and lustres was fully developed. In 1872, William de Morgan moved to 30 Cheney Road, Chelsea, now known as his Chelsea period. Here he produced tiles and some pottery, often with hand-painted floral decoration, animals and birds, usually in ruby luster in imitation of Spanish Hispano Moresque wares. There, were there was little in the way of facilities to produce vessels, uh, certainly in the early days at Chelsea, and de Morgan's firm 
used vessel blanks brought in from other factories, uh, which were then used for decorating and fired at a lower temperature uh, in his own small kiln. Today, his works are eagerly collected and can make many thousands of pounds for good specimens. It does seem that De Morgan is still very much part and parcel of our everyday knowledge of Victorian ceramic production, Victorian art pottery. Here is William holding one of his pots. Um, the pot is in the V&A, the portrait is in the National Portrait Gallery. You can see it's easy to date because his novels are over his shoulder. It's actually dated 1909. Um, and he never made any money, not really. He wasn't a very good businessman. I think the, the pottery at best broke even and relied very much on money coming in from Evelyn's paintings. Um, but uh, he made a fortune when he turned to writing novels at the end of his life. Uh, Joseph Vance, Alice was short, and these novels are pretty stodgy by our, <laughs> by our standards, but they're actually quite interesting because they provide quite a lot of insight um, into his life as a potter. He marries late in life. There are no children. Evelyn's in her late 30s. She, he's in his late 40s, but they definitely uh, saw life through the same lens. They are both devoted to their art. So here we are in Chelsea. Uh, De Morgan spent his entire life, really, in Chelsea, uh, certainly his professional life. As you can see from the plaque here, um, he's, not, he's not buried in the church in Chelsea, but buried at Brookwood Cemetery, which, as you know, is sort of Chertsey way and uh, in the leafy glades of Surrey. Uh, but this plaque, as you can see, commemorates the fact that he did indeed spend most of his life uh, in Chelsea. Um, it, firstly at Cheney Row, then the Vale, and finally um, the old Church Street in Chelsea. And this is the Chelsea Potter with, of course, his sign. But as you know, Chelsea was very much a centre for the ceramics industry. I'm sure you're all familiar with Chelsea Porcelain. So it really had a, a history of ceramic production when De Morgan settled in Chelsea and opened his pottery at uh, the Orange House at uh, Cheney Row in 1872. And the painting again, slightly younger um, image of De Morgan, um, dates again about 18, I think this one's more like the 1880s. So at the top here we have William Morris, down below already looking old, um, Edward Byrne Jones. De Morgan enrolls as a Fellow of the Royal Academy in 1859. He's only at 20 at this stage. And he soon falls in with a like-minded artist. So this is Henry Holiday. I'm afraid I couldn't find um, a picture of him in his youth. Um, but we know that it was Henry Holiday that introduced William de Morgan to William Morris. So under the influence particularly of Henry Holiday, who introduced de Morgan to William Morris in the early 1860s, his first direction is not ceramics, but stained glass. And when he gives this up, and I'm not quite sure that that was a good, good idea to concentrate on ceramics, um, he points out that he did actually make some money from his commissions for stained glass windows. Although the ones that can actually be identified um, are few. Eight churches across the UK, have had windows courtesy of de Morgan of which five are still in situ. I'm showing you one that in fact is no longer where for which it was originally intended. This was originally for St Lawrence or Whitchurch Little Stanmore um, but it was removed and you will now find it in a London school. Most importantly he begins to experiment with stained glass and he really works on stained glass production until 1872, which is when he sets up his pottery in Chelsea on Cheney Row. And he's working very closely with William Morris. The firm is set up in 1861 alongside Edward Byrne Jones. So these windows, here they are, um, they uh, celebrate St Cecilia's this is St Cecilia, she celebrates Handel's Oratorio. So it was now installed 
in the North London Collegiate School. And one of the panels representing King David um, is now in the Stained Glass Museum in Ely. So these were originally for a church, they were removed, but they have been restored and repurposed. And I was showing you there the roundel at the top. I think you'll agree, looking at this, that his style is very much influenced by the Pre-Raphaelite circle, perhaps veering a little bit more towards Ford Maddox Brown uh, than the sort of rather ethereal creatures of Edward Byrne Jones. So it is, according to legend, experimenting with silver nitrate in the production of stained glass windows that de Morgan became interested in luster. And the red luster, uh, which you see here, a uh, fish, um, a dragon and a snake, uh, two sort of like confronting uh, beasts and, a, sh and a, a ship at the end. These are all typical de Morgan motifs and they are, these are in his classic copper luster. Before we leave, please note the galleon down the bottom. This is very much a de Morgan motif and a rather, I'm afraid you're going to cringe, stands for craft man ship. So the galleon was used by many in the arts and crafts movement as a logo uh, for, for its manifesto. So the luster, of course, has a long and uh, complex history, stretching uh, from North Africa through, uh, through Spain, but also the Middle East. So these are examples from Valencia of luster wear, and it's often referred to as Moorish. Uh, because, of course, it comes up from uh, North Africa. Uh, this will uh, travel via Majorca to Italy and become a component in Italian Maiolica. You can see again here some motifs that are going to pop up in de Morgan's own work. So silver nitrate produces the yellow and copper produces different shades of pink. And there's also some underglazed blue, as you can see here, if you're a ceramics expert. So here it is. Now it's shifted to Italy. Uh, Gubbio was one of the major producers of Maiolica uh, in the 19th century. This becomes Maggiolica with a J. But the original 16th century Italian product, Maiolica, takes its name because uh, the pots came via Majorca, at least that's what the experts maintain. Uh, by the 19th century, the tradition of making Majolica was revived under Cantigale, and they have a very distinctive mark underneath, as you can see, a cockerel. And in the 1890s, when de Morgan's health was failing, several of his family died from TB, and this uh, stalked him as an illness throughout his life. And he's going to spend half of the year throughout the 1890s in Florence. He's going to work very closely with Cantigale. It's interesting to speculate that de Morgan was as much interested in the production and chemistry of ceramics making as he was in the decorating of it. You can criticise him for a lack of diversity in terms of his shapes because he was primarily a decorator, again, working in the traditions of Islamic ceramics and Italian Maiolica. So here we've got works by Cantigali. So de Morgan was not the only one interested in reviving lusterware, represented by the jug on the left-hand side. And the top image, uh, we've got here uh, a pictorial would have been called historiato if it was made in the 16th century. Um, this is based on Benozzo Gozzoli's wonderful Medici um, Mercado uh, frescoes of the Medici family in the role of the Magi. You might know it, it's obviously a very important uh, chapel in Florence, but here it's been sort of redesigned by Cantigali. Uh, and then down below, we've got a work by De Morgan, which again is, is figural. So when we didn't know very much about De Morgan, many people not understanding that De Morgan was a, a properly trained fine artist in his own right, uh, frequently attributed these to these figural pieces to Burne Jones. As they often, you can see here, have uh, clear similarities, but they are undoubtedly the work of De Morgan. So that's the 
Cantigali link in the 1890s. Then the other important influence on him, so we've got the luster coming from North Africa and even more importantly from Valencia and Hispano Moresque, where as it's uh, traditionally known. And the other really important influence is Persian ceramics. Now uh, we have two major centers of production, or oh, in fact, we've got more than that, but as far as De Morgan is concerned, in terms of what, what he's looking at in the South Kensington collection, he's got Turkish Iznik ware, which is very distinctive because of its inclusion of this red, it's actually a, a type of earth that it's derived from. Uh, so we've got Iznik ware, which is from Turkey, and then the other really important source for, for De Morgan was what he referred to as Persia, and in particular, really, um, ceramics from Damascus, as we will see. So the serrated edged leaves here in this uh, tile by de Morgan are derived from him looking at, as he called them, Persian prototypes. And also the flattened fan-shaped carnations, which will again pop up in many of his so-called Persian designs. The big difference is that de Morgan never achieves that bright red that you see in the Iznik wares from Turkey. And this is going to be sort of a defining element. So his Persian palette is shades of blue, uh, green, uh, indigo, sort of indigo blue will come from cobalt, manganese will give you the purple. So I'm not a chemist, but I do my best. But the important thing is that there's none of that bright red. De Morgan's very much part and parcel of the period, this intense interest in other cultures. He would have studied pieces at the South Kensington Collection, now the V&A, and the British Museum. There are also plenty of pioneer connect collectors. Um, Henry Wallace, who began his career as a pre-Raphaelite artist. Frederick Duquesne Godman and John Henderson, were great rivals for collecting Islamic ceramics. And the collection that you're looking at here is actually William Morris's own, uh, photographed uh, around about the time that he died by Bedford Lenier, 1896. And most of those uh, pieces are now at Kelmscott. So in fact, that is one of de Morgan's, so this is one of uh, William Morris's own genuine pieces of Persian, as they like to refer to it. Uh, pottery. He was, Morris was much more interested in Islamic arts uh, in the Middle East and in India than he was in Japan, which is obviously uh, one of the sort of other interesting factors that you might keep in the back of your mind. But the wonderful uh, example here of a charger, which as you can see picks up on the theme of the three hunches of grapes, is not by William de Morgan. It's by the most important artist potter of the 19th century, and this is Theodore Depp. Now, the reason that I say that Theodore Depp is the most important artist potter of the 19th century is that he had the backing of the uh, state. He will become artistic director at Serve. Uh, he will have financial resources that de Morgan never enjoyed. He is as much a chemist, again, as he is a designer and a decorator. And he is a pioneer of, these, of this so-called Persian palette. Again, influenced by Damascus, Cairo and Iznik, i.e. Turkish pieces, with their distinctive red. In fact, we know that Theodore Deck preempts William de Morgan by uh, several years because he displayed his first Persian pieces at Paris in 1855, though they were very much experimental at that point. And we also know that Lord Leighton, who is fascinated by Persian ceramics, uh, purchases this dish in 1862 at the London uh, International Exhibition. And Deck is, uh, unlike de Morgan, is able to recreate the red of the Isnik wares. So don't go looking for those um, in a piece by de Morgan. A uh, deck is also famous for that distinctive, almost celeste blue, turquoise blue color, which is known throughout Europe as deck blue. 
um, it's copied, people try to rival it, but you can never quite get a piece as good as Theodore Deck. And in terms of their values, that auction, uh, well, a, a really good piece by Deck will probably outflank a very good piece uh, by William de Morgan, because Deck is like, is the, he's the giant of 19th century art pottery. We call it art pottery because it is very much focusing on using these charges from the French chargère to display, almost like a canvas on which you paint. Theodore Deck was perhaps more interested in form than William de Morgan, but really he sees the surface as of the pot as a vehicle for decorating, whether it's um, three-dimensional, you know, a vase or a jug or a dish. And Deck is also very important in the development of pictorial tiles. So here is the distinction. So we have here, this is Turkish Iznik ware. Initially, it is those three main colours, purple, manganese, blue, cobalt and green. And then by the 1570s, they have perfected this red. And the reason why it's so difficult to recreate it in the West, if I can put it that way, is because it's um, based on a naturally occurring red earth. So the red is a really important way to distinguish between Theodore Deck and William de Morgan. And the other sort of interesting thing is that uh, the De Deck seems to be uh, sort of more interested in recreating Islamic forms. So the mosque lamps, they're based on mosque lamps, the two vases down the bottom. He also includes Kufic script um, into his designs. I've never seen a Kufic script used by de Morgan. So it's interesting that in terms of authenticity, uh, in terms of the actual glaze effects, the red and the forms, uh, Deck is in some ways is more close to the originals, either Isnik or Persian. And the piece on the left-hand side recently sold at auction for a staggering amount of money, over £30,000, simply because it is dated. Because frustratingly, so many of the pieces made uh, by William de Morgan and for, by Deck for that matter, um, are not dated and a lot of them aren't signed either, which is even more frustrating. So here we are back to William de Morgan. So this is just uh, to emphasise that he doesn't pick up on the Isnik red. So this is the real tile. Oh, I say real, it's a, a proper uh, Isnik uh, tile with the distinctive red. But what I really wanted you to pick up here is the, the forms of his so-called Persian palette. Uh, the tulip heads here, um, the fan-like flowers, but most importantly, the sort of serrated edged leaves that I very much associate with paisley shawls. He will occasionally, well, he will uh, certainly pick up on some basic Isnik shapes. So these big bowls, which have these simple feet. And here you can see on the original Isnik basin, which is going to be pre the red earth introduction, you can see cypress trees and these fan shaped carnations, which do indeed become a major sort of design feature of de Morgan's uh, pieces and these stylized tulips. So here's a good example again of the palette and the shape being reproduced by de Morgan. And the other sort of very obvious shape that he will use are the rice dishes that you'll see later that have a dome in the center. De Morgan had plenty of sources to draw on and there was a huge interest um, in Islamic art in the 19th century, comparable to our interest in Japan. So he had Owen Jones's magnificent illustrations of the Alhambra to draw on, published as an elephant folio, massive, fantastic uh, chroma lithographs, um, 1842 to 45, that Owen Jones uh, works on this project. And this will feed into his famous Grammar of Ornament, which is published in 1856. So we've got uh, plates, and then we've got this magnificent, as you can see, they use these today to get a better idea of out how the Alhambra looked um, before pollution sort of has unfortunately diminished some of the color more colorful aspects of the Alhambra's uh, decoration. 
so this is the sort of what I think of as the classic Moorish horseshoe shaped arch here in a panel by William de Morgan and I'm showing you the Alcazar in Seville. Sadly, this is, these are not places that de Morgan traveled to. Florence, yes, but not around Spain. And these pictorial panels uh, really come to the fore uh, when he is designing for P and O liners. Uh, so that's as in um, Orient, P and O, um, in the 1890s, Pacific and Orient. So I imagine that this panel here, with its distinctive um, Islamic horseshoe shaped arches, uh, was designed uh, for one of those P and O ships. Okay, so here's a, a quick uh, chronology. Uh, so he starts to tinker with making uh, pots in a kiln in his parental home at 40 Fitzroy Square. It is here that famously um, he sets fire to a chimney and uh, he then uh, removes himself to Orange House, Cheney Row. His family are also living on Cheney Row, but further along, as you'll see in a minute, closer to the home of Thomas Carlyle at what was number 30, though the road has now been reordered. So he's there at Orange House from 72 to 81. And during this period of intense experimentation, um, he develops his luster wares and his Persian colors in that order. Close to William Morris, he decides to follow Morris to Merton Abbey, uh, but it's not a very successful move. It's too far outside of London. He's still uh, constrained in terms of space. And then when he marries Evelyn Pickering in 1887, the decision is made to move everything back closer to his uh, home in Chelsea with a new factory being developed at Sands and uh, Fulham. He's now in partnership with the architect Halsey Ricardo, who is a designer in his own right. And this is really when the picture panels, like the one I've just showed you with the horseshoe shaped arches, really come to the fore. Uh, the late period is split into two sections um, because the partnership with Halsey Ricardo is dissolved in 1897 and then for the last 10 years the company clings on but by a knife edge to be quite honest, financially I mean, because by that stage tastes have changed and the factory is officially closed in 1907 but the Passenger Brothers, Charlie and Fred, who have been with him since the beginning, and Frank Isles, who is his kill master, uh, carry on. Uh, and then they will be set re-established at Bushy Heath. And I'll show you the marks in a minute so you can get some idea again of the evolution. Having mentioned all of this, I have to say that it's pretty difficult to actually date a piece of De Morgan. Um, because once he's established his luster patterns, and his Persian patterns in the 1870s, um, he will reuse them throughout his career. What you can say is that the pieces made in Fulham are usually of a higher quality and are more daring, particularly in terms of the very large um, tile panels. So here is Orange House. This is now a Catholic church at the end of uh, Cheney Row. So Richard is said, uh, I think number 30 or number seven. The important thing is it is still there. It's very close to uh, the home of uh, Thomas Carlyle. So that was the family home. And de Morgan, after his father died, was expected to look after his mother, Sophia, but also his sisters. Annie will marry, but will sadly die of TB. And she will marry a Dr. Thompson. He's important in our story, as you'll see in a minute. And he had another unmarried sister called Mary. So he was always expected to be a breadwinner. I think that's important to bear in mind. So rather than setting fire to um, his parental, well, not parental home, but the new, the new family home, uh, he establishes his pottery here at the end of Cheney Row in what was number 34. At uh, Merton Abbey, this is what it looks like. This is, these are Morrises. Yes, they're not exactly, in, uh, they don't give me confidence in terms of their viability as buildings, propped up as you can see here with these external um, 
support. But this is William Morris's uh, works at Merton Abbey. And you can see here the mark associated with it celebrates its ecclesiastical history. It's on the river Wandle. It was eventually uh, chosen by, by both De Morgan and William Morris because of its proximity to London and the relative cleanliness of the River Wandle. So here are all the marks. In the Chelsea period, well, you look in vain for marks because most of the tiles are bought in uh, from Holland or from Poole in Dorset as blanks to be decorated. It's not really until it gets to Merton that he has the um, facilities to throw pots. So most of the marked pieces date to Merton Abbey or Sands End. This is the so-called rare tulip mark. You've got there the initials FP for Fred Passenger. This is Fulham, uh, which is Sands End. This is one of the marks for Sands End. Sands End, Pottery, Fulham, William de Morgan. Uh, this is one of the Passenger Brothers or Frank Isles, giving you an idea that the kilns are not massive. They're glossed kilns um, because, well, you know, for a lot of his career, um, he's buying in uh, blank pots to decorate. And then Bushy Heath is set up by Mrs. Perrin uh, with the Passenger Brothers in 1922, and you're going to find a good ex example, good examples of that, in fact, in the museum at Bushy, which is near Watford, so Bushy Heath. And he was quite happy for the, his workers to sort of carry on in his uh, style, and I think he must have felt very frustrated um, that, you know, his novels made so much money, and that could not be ploughed back into the pottery. You know, we saw in his portrait in 1909, that row of books over his shoulder. But by then, of course, the pottery was closed. The v &A has a wonderful collection of his drawings. So here uh, this rather sh lovely shaggy uh, goat. I'm just showing you here how the designs are transferred to a charger. And the, the process of transferal is fascinating. We know quite a lot about it from records left by his workers, but also by his manager, uh, Reginald Blunt, who wrote a lot of fascinating books about Chelsea and is where we get most of our anecdotal information about De Morgan and his circle. One of the principal ways of transferring was by pricking the design, as you can see here for this mermaid. So it's like a stencil, you prick the design and then you use graphite to transfer that to the white surface of the charger. And then obviously you fill in, like painting by numbers, uh, with your uh, coloured glazes. And this obviously is a lustre, so we're looking here at uh, copper. Uh, so this one's marked, as you can see, for Charles Passenger. Although they were very skilled artists, De Morgan did not allow them any freedom as designers. I'm often a little surprised that they stayed with him and didn't ever attempt to branch out on their own. I mean, he wanted his designs transcribed um, as accurately as possible from his original drawings onto his box. And I'll talk about how the tiles are made in just a minute. But as I said, it's fascinating how He's as much interested in the chemistry behind ceramics as he is in their designs. So here's another good example. We've got the original design in the v &A, antelopes with lizards. The back is just as beautiful as you can see the way with these concentric circles. And then Fulham, so Sands End, and then the CP uh, for Charlie Passenger. So that's the painter, not the designer. That's what I'm trying to put over. So uh, the famous tiles for Charles Dodgson were originally around his fireplace. Uh, they've been removed and are turned into a fire screen, which has rather upset the symmetry of the design with the galleon at the top. But of course, this has led uh, to much speculation about some of the characters in Lewis Carroll's uh, fairy stories, like the Jabberwocky. Uh, which way round was it? Was it, you know, was that inspired by one of de Morgan's tiles or was it the other way round? We certainly know that his brother-in-law, uh, Reginald Thompson, um, appears to have had a hand in sort of doodling some of the monsters that you see here uh, transformed into de Morgan tiles. 
So it's quite fun just sort of tracking uh, across uh, the National Trust houses and other private houses. Um, uh, here is the fireplace in the drawing room at Whittick Manor, and you can see the tiles in situ, how they would be arranged. So a combination of uh, repeat pattern and in individual tiles. The porcupine's very famous, the eagle, the snake, that's an incubus. And as I say, these fantastic creatures. So the figural pieces are rare. For a long time, they were misattributed uh, to uh, Burne Jones. We now know these are all because we've got all of the pattern books in the VA, but nobody bothered to look at them. They were only re relatively recently discovered. Uh, the one on the right hand side is the story of Achilles being trained by the centaur. But you can see here the very obvious influence of Majolica in the sort of historiato tradition. So, luster and historiato. I'm trying to sort of show you how he's running all these parallels. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy. You can't say one comes after the other. The styles run in parallel. So a design here for a tile. So this is the incubus. This is the uh, snake um, grasping a cherry, which has very obvious sort of connotations. And here he is, the snake in the center of a luster dish. Uh, the uh, fish on the Right hand side, very famous because that's using a wax resist technique to create this uh, three dimensional effect of the nets over the fish. And I mentioned these rice dishes that have the dome in the center that were being made by British manufacturers to send to India where they were being used for practical purposes. But De Morgan particularly favors these domed dishes, this one with fish. Uh, by the time you get into the 1890s, his lusters are becoming increasingly sophisticated. So we've got here uh, multiples of silver nitrate and copper to produce here the fish swimming in a sea of pink luster. Or here the sort of silver nitrate used for the wings of this beast. These are both in Birmingham. There were people who tried to rival, uh, so Moore and Co, uh, which is one of the uh, Shropshire companies, asked Walter Crane to develop a whole a little clutch, seven vases attributed to Walter Crane. They make an enormous amount of money at auction. I don't think they were uh, sort of commercially successful, but they certainly were lauded artistically at the time. So the vases, including this famous one here of Odysseus, these are all Walter Crane, for Moore and Co. And Lewis Foreman Day designed the tiles down the bottom. But I'm mentioning them because it shows you how people try to walk in De Morgan's footsteps. And also sometimes these pieces are passed off as De Morgan. As you can see, the shapes of the bear and the galleon in particular, very distinctive. These are Moore and Co. Um, in the uh, famous Iron Bridge uh, collection. And uh, they are walking in De Morgan's footsteps, but interestingly, these are not designed by Walter Crane. I don't think anybody's actually worked out exactly who designed these particular uh, charges for Moore and Co. And this is John Pearson, who we think might have begun his career with De Morgan before he became heavily associated with C.R. Ashby's Guild of Handicraft. And he will work in both the uh, lustre tradition so as you can see, this is really just trying to copy the luster without actually producing the effect, chemically, I mean. And he'll also work in the um, Isnit tradition as well, or the Persian tradition. So the most sophisticated lusters are the platinum ones, which come right at the end. Moonlight is the trade name uh, given to them. So this is the pot in the V&A held by De Morgan. And these are these platinum lusters at uh, fish and hairs, which I love, the moonlight suite. There was a sunset suite as well. And, you know, emphasizing that he likes his beasts, he likes his birds, he likes his monsters, and he likes his ships, as in craftsmanship. This is the bowl by, painted by Fred Passenger. You can see it's in that um, Isnic form with that large foot. And these are platinum luster tiles. And this one here made on its own made £6,000, which gives you some idea that you have to have a deep pocket if you want to buy the lusters. 
In terms of the uh, Persian palette, he was bound to be influenced by his commission given to him by Lord Leighton in 1877 to fit his collection of tiles largely from Damascus into the Arab Hall. So you're seeing this is the genuine article from Leighton's Arab Hall, and this is the magnificent panel by De Morgan. So like you can see here, all the sort of things I'm talking about, particularly the um, serrated edges to the leaves, the flattened fan shapes of the carnations. That's Bermontoft, their uh, a very talented decorator, Leonard King, produces some pretty close uh, equivalents, as you can see, uh, to De Morgan. And, all right, so just to finish, I wanted to sort of uh, show you the links that he has to William Morris and some of these big projects. So um, here is Morris's showrooms on Oxford Street, uh, an idyllic view, as you can see, of Merton Abbey. Uh, the showrooms were acquired in 1877. You can see De Morgan's pots in the window. Uh, in terms of direct uh, relationships, the Membelin Hall tile panel, now in the V&A, composed of 66 uh, tiles, is as early as 1876, it was made for the banker Edward Baring. If you go to uh, Kelmscott Manor, you'll find here the tiles allegedly fitted by Jane herself um, in the green room, um, and the swan tile is actually a design by William uh, Morris. So it's a combination of William Morris tiles and William de Morgan tiles. But I wanted to emphasize just how close William Morris and de Morgan are. On the famous voyage from Kelmscott House to Kelmscott Manor along the River Thames, de Morgan was one of the party uh, where Morris fulfilled this ambition to travel from Kelmscott House to Kelmscott Manor. So it's a close friendship. They actually decide to go to Merton Abbey together. And you can see echoes of Morris's designs in De Morgan's. For instance, here, Rose and Trellis is very close to Morris's wallpaper of uh, approximately 1864. And then this is the uh, card that you would get uh, from Morris and Co. Trade card showing you all the different tile patterns. This again is emphasizing the fan shape, which was so popular. You can see some of the fantastic beasts down the bottom that we saw in uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, fireplace. This is a school in the New Forest where I found, it gives you an idea of how big the tiles are. They're above average size. They're, more, they're nine by nine and not six by six, which was the standard. And you would make the patterns up, basically a combination of the two different types of fan. And this is in America, in Chicago. The important thing is that Morris & Co. had an international reputation. If you know anything about Adelaide, you know that there were several houses that Morris fitted out in Adelaide uh, for the Bar Smith family, and they were likely to choose after 1875 De Morgan tiles. You put them in the cheeks of your fireplace. This is the famous Triple B uh, tile, this one here looks like a sunflower, made for Barnard, Bishop and Barnard. And this was a very important supplier commissioning tiles from Morris & Co. In, from the 1870s onwards. Uh, these are the so-called Bedford Park design, Daisy, Bedford Park Daisy, a uh, Bedford Park turn and green, designed by Richard Norman Shaw, Morris actually has his own outlet there, such as the demand for textiles, wallpapers, and tiles. So Bedford Park Daisy. And then as his uh, confidence grows, the panels become more ambitious, seen here in this rather wonderful uh, dragon-like beast. So uh, the Empress fan is a very large repeat. As you can see, when she starts to add them together, it becomes a very impressive um, element. And it's particularly under the influence of Halsey Ricardo that you get these really big tile panels. Again, some of these we think were trial pieces for the, the P&O Commission, as he worked on 12 liners uh, for P&O. And you might have seen these in the V&A liner exhibition. So this is again showing you the sort of interrelationship between um, the original over here, um, Islamic ceramic, 
and the pot by De Morgan. I'm going to end with sort of some really beautiful pieces. So he loved peacocks. So here, you can't say that the peacock belongs to any particular period. Merton Abbey here and Sands End. But you can see how much more sophisticated the design has become um, in Sands End. Here, deeper, richer colours. An almost cartoon-like peacock here. And then I love these uh, confronting peacocks, one in the Persian palette and one in lustre. I always think he looks, this one looks like he should be sort of like a 1960s cartoon character. I prefer these two. And then again, peacocks. And that's my rice dish with the um, bulbous elements in the centre. And then uh, snakes and uh, seahorses. I'm just showing you the amazing richness of his imagination. Snakes here combined with what appear to be sunflowers. And then fish here. There's that distinctive bowl with the very large um, base, very close to the Isnik original. Uh, you know, you can see here, his, it's not about the shape. He's not a studio potter. He's no, you know, he's not going to be in the same category as Bernard Leach. He's, he sees his pots as a surface to decorate. So here, the fishing lesson, you could reverse it, obviously. This is the original design in the V&A. I love the herons. Again, this is an Isnic dish with a ship. It's a 17th century one, so a bit later. But you can see how, again, there's an obvious synergy between the... Uh, isn't it queer? And the De Morgan uh, charger, fish around the outside. The galleons, the inevitable pun on craftsman ship, uh, here in luster. And sometimes the galleons are very obviously what I call the Mary Rose type. And in other cases, they are closer to triremes down the bottom here. So here, oh, that's the poor at the top. Here you can see how it, how, the, how these they were used. So you could you could get them in lust, you could get them in per, Persian palette, or this the cheaper run here of green, which is just gives me a minute to explain how you do these tiles because De Morgan came up with a very ingenious way of reproducing his designs. So the painters copied onto tissue paper. So you would put a piece of tissue paper. Uh, on a piece of glass, you would have the design that you were copying um, on the other side of the piece of glass, and you would copy it off, you would colour it in, you would then put the piece of tissue paper face down on the tile, you would cover it uh, with a glaze, you would then fire it, and the tissue paper would burn away, leaving the design on the tile. Very clever, but still very time consuming. But that's basically how it was done. It was this tissue paper transferal. It also meant, as I said, that he could design, control the designs. The artist had no freedom at all. Uh, they had to follow his designs uh, to the letter. So they are the P&O um, pieces between 1882 and 1900. T.E. Colcutt, Thomas Colcutt, also a very well-known architect, uh, was responsible for designing these floating hotels. We think this panel of galleons was for the SS Malta, uh, 1895 in date, so Sands End period. This was definitely a trial for P&O. Remember, it's Pacific and Orient. And then uh, these are what they look like in situ. They were used in, in the corridors, but particularly for the smoking rooms. So this is blue peonies for SS Arabia. It's this pattern down the bottom that is described as blue peonies. And you can see a lot of the designs are Isnic um, in terms of their reference to um, Islamic designs, tulips, flattened carnations. And then the Arab Hall, obviously, with the, an old photograph here showing you some of their collection of De Morgan pots. And it was really doing this that De Morgan helped De Morgan to perfect his Islamic designs, his, you know, the whole technology. He claimed that it cost him £500, not the other way around, not Lord Leighton. He wasn't a good businessman and evidently um, he overrun his budget by £500 because he wanted it to be as perfect as possible. So here, uh, it's hard to tell, isn't it, which are the De Morgan tiles and which are the genuine Isnic ones, or I should say, 
These are all tiles, mostly from Damascus, not from Turkey. And they are Ottoman Empire period. And you'll notice a lot of birds, but the birds are all in effect killed off, uh, conforming to their religious beliefs uh, by either the tile itself or by having a white line drawn through the parrot. So he had to make up all the breakages. So uh, Leighton House is somewhere that you could visit to see De Morgan and, most importantly, the original tiles from Damascus that inspired him. And then these big projects related to Halsey Ricardo coming on board and opening the new factory at Sands End. Um, here, uh, the parrots are 16 tiles. So entire rooms can be covered. In this case, the Tavard Inn at Turnham Green. This is the entrance. And this is inside the bar and at the Debenham House and it's on Addison Road. Exterior is a combination of Berman Toft uh, and Carrara Ware by uh, Dalton. But the important thing is that um, you realise that Halsey Ricardo was a designer in his own right. So here's a sheet of his designs that are now in the V&A. So this was a very equal partnership between De Morgan and Halsey Ricardo in the 1890s with the factory at Sands Ends, financed 4,000 from Halsey Ricardo, 4,000 from Evelyn de Morgan to launch it. So this, uh, these are the entrance uh, tiles, fan shape. This is a panel uh, that's in the de Morgan Foundation, but you can see it's very close to this uh, frieze. And then the amazing mosaics are by Gaetano uh, Neo, who was one of the, originally one of the uh, models in the uh, group. And my last slide are the remarkable panels made by De Morgan initially and then Dalton uh, for Postman's Park, uh, which of course is a project uh, for GF Watts. And Postman's Park, as the name suggests, is very close to the central post office in the city of London. And these uh, tile panels uh, commissioned by Mrs. G.F. Watts after her husband died, 13 by De Morgan, and then we moved down the bottom to Dalton, uh, to celebrate the unsung working class heroes of the 19th century, as you can see. Fascinating. And again, perhaps goes back to where we started in terms of De Morgan was no socialist like William Morris, but he would have, like the Wattses, believed in social justice. And by the way, he did help Mrs. Watts uh, set up her pottery at Compton. It's a big story to tell.